afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and thank you, Carolyn, for inviting me to um, have the exhibition, which is on the Portland campus, just to make that clear in case you haven't been there yet. Um, and also for inviting me to, um, to talk with uh, you this afternoon. We know how ill we see the things amongst which we live and that it is often necessary for someone to come from a distance to tell us what surrounds us. That's a, a quote from, from Rilke, from uh, his book Where Silence Reigns. And um, this is kind of how I feel about seeing my own work, which is to say sometimes I don't. Um, although I know it better than anyone else, um, sometimes I don't see it because I'm surrounded by it, because I live it. Um, which is why I'm so grateful when others see my work and tell me what they see especially um, when the person is as perceptive and articulate and receptive as Diana Tweet, who wrote um, the essay that Carolyn just mentioned, um, and which I'll be reading just a little excerpt from, from uh, later on. Um, I also want to thank her for coming up with the title for this show, um, Verge, which um, is also the title that I'm using for this talk, because I think it um, when she, she mentioned the, the title, it felt like it really spoke to really my whole uh, body of work and also just my, um, perhaps my approach and um, kind of what I'm after. So verge, meaning the edge, rim, or margin of something, um, the limit or point beyond which something begins to occur. You know that feeling when you just feel like you're, you're getting towards something. Um, and in British, I also like that it's that narrow strip of, uh, of turf bordering uh, a pathway, so that little bit of green, so somehow that rang a bell as well for me. Um, most of the work that I'll show you this afternoon is from the past um, few years, um, but there is some work that dates further back uh, to give a broader context also to the newer work and just to, to give those of you especially who aren't familiar with my work just kind of a broader experience here. Um, notebooks. So in order to take this look back, um, to cast myself back to the time that I made some of these, especially the older pieces, I went through about 10 years of, of notebooks, sketchbooks, um, that I've you know, kept since then. Something that I actually don't tend to do, I don't know about you guys, but I, I tend to keep notebooks, but I hardly ever look back at them. I kind of was that way as a student as well for all subjects. I would take notes, but I never really read them. Um, so it was a in really interesting, um, emotional, kind of raw experience. So also very strange how it kind of compressed time, all these years into you know, a week of, of reading these. And I keep kind of a, a mix of lots of things in them, everything from lists of things I want to do, little sketches, quotes that I read from others. Um, things I have to buy, dreams, I went back and read, boy, the, boy she, that was weird. <laughs> so, um, um, and it kind of, um, going through them helped me sort of see some threads through my work that maybe I kind of knew were there, but helped kind of give a little bit more of an organizing principle for this talk, hopefully. Um, so I decided against a sort of strictly chronological approach to my work. Um, uh, Partly because I think it gives a sort of a false impression of one's work as being this sort of linear progression, and I, I never feel like that's really quite right, um, at least for my work. Um, so instead, um, I'm going to um, introduce the work um, sort of around these sort of loose themes or, or concepts. This is my first PowerPoint, <laughs> and I've, um, I don't know how to change the color for the background. Someone can show me that sometime. So it's on white. Um, I hope it's not too bright or glary. Um, so the, the, the themes are time accumulation, the settings for missing stories, air, candy gems, glass, cones and Goya, and then finally the, the, the Kurt show, um, Verge. Um, so throughout the talk, I'll be referring um, back to some notebook entries. Uh, my own th thoughts, quotes from others, small sketches. So what I'm trying to do um, for you um, is give you a sense of 
sort of where my thoughts were at the time of making these things, um, but also to give a sense how kind of messy the process is, even though it's kind of neatened up for, for a talk. It has to be, I guess. Um, and some pieces I'll linger on um, quite a long time or go into in depth, and other pieces I'll kind of uh, go over a bit more quickly. Um, again, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with my work, um, almost everything I do is, is paper-based, mostly drawing, prints, and now actually making some three-dimensional forms with paper. Um, I have sometimes have ventured into other materials, but so far paper seems to still have endless possibilities for me. So um, in this first section, I'll um, be reading from my notebooks or excerpts from my notebooks um, a little bit more than in other sections, and that's partly because I'm going a bit further back in time. But it's also because what I read um, still has relevance for me today, so it's just sort of setting the groundwork. Um, try this first piece. I wish it was a bit darker in here, but this, we'll work with this. Um, this is an ink drawing called uh, Point Me in the Direction Home. It's about four feet wide and about 15 feet tall. It's hard to get a sense of scale there. Um, and it's, I show, I'm starting with it because it's the first large-scale uh, work that I did that used this sort of slow process of accretion, sort of letting the drawing unfold um, with the accumulation of marks. And at this time, um, when I was making this, I was particularly interested in, um, in the idea of time and also making marks and the relationship between the two um, and um, through their accumulation, uh, through the accumulation of marks. Um, so I started this in 2003 when I was doing um, a semester of my graduate studies in Berlin. Um, and then I finished it um, in 2004 um, in, in Glasgow where I was doing my, um, my MFA. And now I'm gonna, just going to read a few excerpts while I was making this and, and show you a few details as well. Um, I'm also hoping, sorry, a little aside, that especially for the students, it might be useful to, um, or interesting, <laughs> to hear about um, sort of the, the thought process, process at, this, at the time, the doubts, the things that excited me, the things I was questioning, etc. So that's a detail. And I'm not sure I mentioned it's, it's ink on paper. So um, on November 3rd, 2003, I wrote, Tolerance for a stripped, bare existence. Silence, black ink, white paper, making marks for hours. Before I know it, five or six hours have passed. There's not much to see after that. And a few days later, I wrote, I have hope for this new beginning. Black, leaving slight white lines. So all the white there is not drawn. The white is left. I've been, so I'm drawing around um, the lines. Another detail. At this time, I was also really grappling with, and, and I continue to, sort of how to make a whole out of these incremental parts. It's still something I, I it's a, a big question. Um, and I was also thinking about subject matter. I had a hard time sort of isolating the one thing I wanted to, to draw. I wanted everything sort of at once. Um, I wanted kind of a, a simultaneity, all the thoughts in my head to go down there at once. So, um, it's another detail. So a number related to that um, I wrote in, my, in, in a notebook, an entry. I can't grasp all these little parts that come to me and make a whole. Fences and soldiers and ships, gardens, coils, knots, hedges and maps, love, war, violence, colors and gold. back to the U.S., back to Maine, I made a number of smaller drawings. They're still quite large. They're about three feet by four feet in that range. Um, the drawings are smaller than the previous ones, but the marks also got smaller, so there was a sort of greater intensity uh, in the uh, accumulation of marks. This is an example called Above and Beyond from 2005. Um, there was a strong push and pull going on as I drew 
yeah. whether or not to let the marks resolve into something, something nameable. Um, I was also concerned with the question of intent. You know, I talked to some students also about this this, this morning in Duncan's class. Um, should I know where I'm going when I'm drawing? It seems, it always seemed to me that everyone else, all other artists knew where they were going. It was just me that didn't know where I was going. I'm sure that's an illusion. Um, so I tried to, here are a few, uh, the detail, you can see the very tiny marks, especially in, in area. I tried to revel in or at least feel comfortable with this feeling of being lost. And somehow, intuitively, I knew that's how I needed to proceed. But I also felt like I should know where I was, where I was headed. So I felt a great deal of relief when I came across um, an article in the New Yorker called Present Waking Life. And um, it's about uh, the poet John Ashbery's process. And I find it's, for me, it's really useful to, to often to cross disciplines and find out, you know, how are musicians working? How are writers working? And to sort of learn from their processes as well. So um, what uh, is written there is what he, John Ashbery, is trying to do is jumpstart a poem by lowering a bucket down into what feels like a kind of underground stream flowing through his mind. A stream of continuously flowing poetry, or perhaps poetic stuff would be a better way to put it. Whatever the bucket brings up will be his poem. Since he's always dipping the bucket into the same stream, his poems will resemble one another. But because the stream varies according to climatic conditions, what's on his mind, the weather, interruptions, they will also be different. And he called his process managed chance. And I really liked that, and I felt really um, like it was describing my process as well. And it's, it's just very reassuring to, to read about someone working the way you feel you're working yourself. Um, that's another detail of that piece. Is this in focus? Can someone tell? I yes. wear glasses, so I can't tell. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so around this time, I was asked to do a show at uh, Merrimack College uh, in Massachusetts uh, for the winter of 2005-06. Uh, and I w decided I wanted to do something really uh, big. I wanted to draw something that viewers would uh, experience rather than just to look at. And I wanted something that would envelop them, that would create a world for them. Um, I'll get to the images of that in a moment. But before I show you pictures of that, I'd like to show you um, a painting, this one, which had a great deal of influence on me at the time. Um, this is Albrecht Eldorfer's painting called The Battle of Alexander and Isis, which was painted in 1529. Okay. Um, for some time, I had been reading uh, W.G. Sebald's books, um, and his prose poem, After Nature, introduced me to this painting. Looking at the painting, the sort of the, the, the crowds of soldiers on the landscape uh, made me think about how land could hold memory. Often I wondered about the land where battles had been waged. How was the land different? How did it hold that memory? What was the visual sort of remnants that might um, be there? So these are the kinds of the things I was thinking about um, as I drew this. This is a piece called Spillway. Um, I'm happy to say its home is now at, in the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. Um, it's eight and a half feet by eight and a half feet square. It's ink on two sheets of paper joined in the middle vertically. It's, um, you probably can't see the seam. You can hardly see it in, in person, actually. Um, and I'm going to show you a number of details of Spillway. And as you look at these, I'm going to read some quotes again. Um, and as I read the quotes, if you can, try to not make too much like a close association with what I'm reading and the images. I'm not trying to describe anything you see. I'm just trying to, again, give a sense of what was going on um, in my little brain. Um, you know, sometimes when you're reading, um, at least for me, there's a, there's a line that's so evocative, um, I can't read any farther. I just want to kind of stop and imagine that, um, 
the image that I'm seeing. Um, such was the case when I read the, the following from Simon Shama's Landscape and Memory. Um, he wrote it after he visited um, an ancient forest in Poland, which is his ancestral homeland. Um, show you. There's a detail. He wrote, it is haunted land where greatcoat buttons from six generations of fallen soldiers can be discovered, lying amidst the woodland ferns. He also wrote, such grassy swellings, tumuli, were the first marks that man made upon the European landscape. Also that idea of the, the marks you make on the landscape and the correlation between the marks I'm making on the paper um, had a real interest for me. So another detail. I wrote this little note of encouragement to myself while I was working. I just said, just keep drawing. Intent will build. And on a less hopeful day, I wrote, all of your small voices don't add up to a big one. At the time, I also read something from uh, Susan Sontag. Um, it's from her book, Regarding the Pain of Others, and just felt very important um, sort of point. She writes, someone who is perennially surprised that depravity exists, who continues to feel disillusioned, even incredulous when confronted with evidence of what humans are capable of inflicting in the way of gruesome hands on cruelties upon other humans, has not reached moral or psychological adulthood. No one after a certain age has the right to this kind of innocence or superficiality, to this degree of ignorance or amnesia. And this is something I wrote. Um, I want to make drawings completely unshocking, that don't demand your attention, <coughs> that seem not to care if they're looked at, that have no particular point of view, no opinion, no philosophy. Which is probably impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just to give you a little sense of a, of a notebook page. Um, here I'm actually trying to figure out the drawing, which never works, really, <laughs> trying to figure out this way, but it still is helpful, I think. At the time, I was still, I was thinking of it as four panels rather than two panels. And you can see some of the little sketches, little forms that might make their way into the drawing. Um, and also, I wrote down, down here, I don't know if you can see it, a quote from Luke Toymans, and he wrote, um, excuse me, in order to show something, I paint a lot away. And I thought, in a way, adding lots and lots and lots and accumulating like almost too much information so you're overwhelmed has a similar effect. I don't know if that's true, but I thought. This is um, another painting of Albrecht Aldorfer called um, St. George and the Dragon. Um, at this time, I was, I was also thinking a lot about uh, what kind of effect my drawing would have on the viewer, <coughs> thinking about sort of the, the kind of time involved in viewing. So I was reading um, a book by Christopher Wood called Albrecht Altdorfer and the Origins of Landscape. Um, if you're interested in landscape painting, it's, it's a very um, um, wonderful book, and it talks about, um, or puts forth the idea that Altdorfer is really the first European painter, anyway, back in the early 1500s, to make landscapes, to make independent landscapes. So landscapes that don't have a figure in them, etc. So it's, it's an interesting take. Um, so anyway, he writes about this painting, something that I wanted, was hoping how viewers would look at my work. So he writes, the time of the picture becomes the time of the experience of the beholder. The forest interior is the perfect object. No road leads out. The beholding subject submits to the confusion, the mixed pleasure and fear of non purposive wandering. This whole idea of wandering without a purpose. That's kind of what I wanted um, the experience to be in um, Spillway. This is another really close up uh, image of Spillway. I think this is the last detail. Towards the 
end of working on this, maybe about seven months into it. I think it, it's probably about eight months that I worked on this drawing, um, just to get a sense of how I was feeling. I wrote, I feel like an island. I've moved the drawing to downstairs. I can see all of it together. These are the hours of my life I'm giving you. Yesterday I cried. I said, I can't do it. I can't make it matter. That's the full view again. I actually finished the drawing on the gallery wall. Um, and something about having that time limit, uh, that deadline, actually really sort of pushes and, and, and fuels me at times. Um, all along while I was drawing this, I liked the little parts, but I couldn't make it work as a whole. And it wasn't until I worked on it on the gallery walls and, um, you know, two days before the opening that I, found my, I, fa I felt like I finally found the solution to it. This is my last little um, entry that I wrote regarding this work. I wrote, in the end or at the end of something like this, there's not much to say. You just feel a bit different. So moving on to another work. This is a, a, a woodcut called Heap. Um, I was still um, looking at that, that painting, Battle of Alexander, um, and I don't know if you could see the relationship to it, but to me it was really just all these little figures in the foreground of the painting. I wanted to sort of just put on a pile, the heap. Um, and it's a reduction woodlock print, so that means it was one block of um, wood was used, and with each successive color, a little more wood is carved away. So there are about 35 layers on this. And I think, it, to me, it relates to that whole theme of time and accumulation in um, l less so across space, like spillaway was this accumulation of marks over a, a broad expanse. This was an accumulation in layers. And this is a, a detail to give you a sense of the, um, the texture. This is really close up. But you can see how, you know, sort of taking the, the, the woodcut process to, to the limit, how many layers of ink can I get on this before? It just won't even take anymore. It won't hold anymore. So the last piece I'll show you in this section, it's a bit washed out, sorry, but um, is a more recent piece called Firelight from 2010. It's colored pencil on paper. It's about, that's actually about the size it is, um, right there. Um, it was part of a solo show at Coleman Burke Gallery in New York in the spring of 2010. And again, I go back to quoting Christopher Wood, who wrote that book on, on Altdorfer, and he says, his landscapes lack any argumentative or discursive structure. They make no move to articulate a theme. Instead, they look like the settings for missing stories. And I really like that idea of having, of, or it just, it just rang true to me that there's, yeah, they do feel like mess, uh, settings for missing stories. I'm going to move on to that idea. Oh, sorry, there's a detail of that first. So obviously a large, a big shift here is that working, I had been working primarily in, in black and white um, and sort of started working with color maybe um, uh, three, four years ago, sort of almost exclusively in color. So the setting for missing stories. Um, I kept thinking about that line and how it might relate to um, these, all these little sketches I was finding in my notebooks throughout the years. And a lot of them were sketches of a stage or like a, like a theatrical stage with curtains. And I didn't really know why this kept creeping up. I, I don't go to the theater. I'm not particularly <coughs> even interested in that. But it, so it seemed connected somehow to that last idea of sort of these missing stories um, having a setting. Um, so in this section, I'm going to show some, some finished work um, in addition to a few little sketches that relate to that theme of the stage, including my largest drawing um, to date, um, which I'll spend the most time on. 
So here are just a couple little sketches. These are like this big, you know, a couple of inches big in my notebooks. More to probably don't like to see. And here's a little sketch next to a finished piece, which is, um, I think that sort of the, the stage-like <coughs> setting is, is pretty clear. Um, this is also a, a, a woodcut, a woodblock print, but it's, it's done on paper, the screen part. And then this is, uh, the sort of curtain-like shapes are carved in wood, and then the, the woodcut is, is glued on that um, wood block. And uh, you, I don't know if you can make it out, but these, all these little figures are little toy soldiers. Here's another piece that um, for me has, again, this sort of stage-like presence with curtains or sort of remnants of curtains. Um, this is called uh, Limbo. It's also from 2010 and also was in the, that um, Coleman Burke show. And that's also about the size, <clears throat> the actual size that it is, is how it's projected there. The next three are, are, are smaller works, um, and um, they were all they were at, <clears throat> excuse me an exhibition um, that was at Bates College last uh, summer um, called Emerging uh, Disorder, um, and it was together with Amy Stacy Curtis and Allison Hildreth. <laughs> um, and this one um, is called uh, Dear Green Place, uh, 2011, um, uh, color pencil and graphite on paper. Again, I think you could, sort of, you could see the, the stage-like imagery, even something of an audience, perhaps. This one's called Procession, also roughly the same size. These are all small. This one's called Red Do, D-W, Red Do. And I'm also proud to say that this one and the first one of these three um, are now in the um, Bates Museum collection. So this, <clears throat> Next drawing, um, I'm going to spend some time on, um, and I'm also going <coughs> to try and give a sense of how it was made, some of the uh, ways I approached working on this. This is called And Air 2, and Air also, and Air 2. It's kind of a mouthful to keep saying, but um, anyway, it's six and a half feet tall by 13 feet long. So it's, it's a large piece. It's colored pencil on a single sheet of paper. Um, which was uh, something of a constraint, working on paper this size. Um, remember the spillway, the large ink drawing I showed you earlier was on two sheets, so I could actually maneuver it quite easily. I would work on spillway, I would work on it on the floor, I'd work on it on the wall, I'd work on it on a table, whereas this, the paper was just too big, I could not move it by myself, so I had to work on the wall, which is possibly, um, in part, uh, reason for the more sort of vertical kind of imagery rather than that sort of viewpoint from above that Spillway had. So for this one, um, I'll just show you a couple of details. Again, it's colored, I think I said that, it's colored pencil on paper. that sort of curtain-like uh, imagery coming through. So how do you start when you have this six and a half by 13 foot piece of paper? Um, it frankly, it, it felt a bit daunting. So I kind of um, used two approaches in this drawing that helped me um, get started. Um, their, their approach is not entirely new to my work, but kind of new in the extent that I use them perhaps. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, this is a <coughs> tiny little sketch I made. You can see these are staple marks, so you can tell it's very small. Um, and it's what I was thinking about for that drawing. 
And it's based um, on a memory of the following photograph um, from the New York Times 2007. Um, it's just one of those photographs that you know I, I had in my studio and I just found it remarkable, um, both in terms of just the emotional content, um, this Marines um, resting um, in, in Ramadi, in, in rock, and, and also just in, compositionally, colors. I, somehow I felt like it was a, a, like a Renaissance painting to me. I found it really beautiful. And I had no intent of necessarily using it. It was just years later that I actually started using some of the, the, the imagery in it. So I actually used these, um, this group of sleeping um, marines as a framework for my drawing. And <clears throat> you can see that in this next slide. This is very dark. It's intentionally so. I had to make it dark so you could actually see the um, little um, um, vine charcoal uh, lines, which you don't see at the end, you know, they, they're erasable. But <clears throat> I don't know if you can see the soldiers at all. Well, first of all, they're, they're upside down. So perhaps you can make a, like a head here and an arm, another head here, boots here. And they're also flipped mirror image, so they're, um, it's the, the drawing done, the photograph twice, you know, and facing. This is the drawing partway underway on my studio wall. So one way that, um, <clears throat> these are a couple of stencils that um, I made um, for working on the drawing. Talk about that in a minute. There's one, there's one on just on darker paper. Um, it's just hanging there. I don't think I actually drew it there. But what I started doing was cutting these stencils that were some of these, that matched some of these shapes from that photograph. Either um, sort of a space between the, the sleeping marines or a part like a, a cap, an elbow, a fold in the cloth. And <clears throat> so, I'm, and I made these little, you know, and then I would cut those out as little stencils. And what, <clears throat> what that helped me with is I would put the stencil down and I would start drawing in that area and I found it really helpful to isolate small areas to work on. So I didn't have to think about, okay, how am I dealing with this giant piece of paper? I'm just going to focus on this little bit right here. Um, and once I was working within <coughs> a little area, um, I would sometimes draw imagery from other sources or just work from my own imagination. This on the left is a little um, detail of a painting by James Ensor, um, Entry of Christ into Brussels from 1888. I don't know if you could make it out, but you could see how I'm borrowing some of the imagery, like here, this, to here, even some here, like those striped sweater there. Um, here's another example. That's a, <clears throat> a tiny bit of the of that big drawing. These are some sketches I did at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art um, from a show of uh, medieval alabasters they had, and this little figure you know, made it into the drawing. And then a sort of process um, uh, image. And I thought it was interesting, hopefully, for you to see how I was trying to work out this particular area. This is how I was, I had, you can see I have some of the color pencil stuff um, drawn already. And I was using um, these pieces of tracing paper just to, to draw over it, um, just to try out different things. And then you can see the, the finished bit at the bottom. Okay, these are little um, sketches I did. They're also small from my, from my notebooks. And um, this is kind of going back to that very first quote I read you um, from Rilke, how sometimes you need someone else to tell you about your work. Um, 
So these are sketches of um, gift wrappings that I had made for Christmas and presents, and then um, the open gift, you know, the open uh, wrappers just strewn on the floor, and I just decided to one morning to draw them, right? Um, so I was really surprised and pleased when I read this in a following in a review. So Daniel Caney um, wrote a review of the, of the Bates show, um, Emerging Disorder, and about my um, piece, that's another detail of And Air 2, and he wrote the following, the imagery is crumpled and fleeting despite the fact that it practically hums with oversaturated hues. Some look like the wrapping paper scraps on the Christmas morning floor, especially since the colorful detritus creates an actual landscape imbued with moments, memories, and distorted traces, whose job it was to hide their initial contents. I was just, he, he writes about that. I had not even made that connection between those drawings. Um, I made those drawings, forgot about them, and then was working on this. And I just loved that he found this in there, that, and I didn't, hadn't, had, just hadn't seen it. So, air. So I'm going to show a few pieces that kind of, um, I think, were related to the sense of lightness. And I think already in that last piece, certainly in the title, and air too, but also in the amount of white space that is around it, um, getting a kind of lightness. Um, I feel like my work is getting lighter, more buoyant. Um, Perhaps it's, as Italo Cavino says, um, being the search for lightness as a reaction to the weight of living. Um, or maybe I just feel lighter. <laughs> so being around that big drawing in my studio really made me want to see the drawing come off the wall um, into relief. Um, I wanted it to be even lighter, and I wanted, I, I was just imagining it kind of being so light that these pieces would just kind of float away. Um, and I made these some sketches and then some more finished drawings, trying to imagine these forms um, from that previous drawing, how they would look in relief. Okay? So this is a little sketch in my notebook. You can see I'm trying to sort of work out the planes of, you know, of the forms, um, again, if trying to imagine, drawing in 2D, but trying to imagine 3D. This is a, a, a drawing, probably about 30 by 40 inches, that um, is called Little Peak. It was also at the Bait, in the Bates show. And again, trying to get a sense of these planes. And this one called Hollow. I think you could especially see it here and perhaps relate some of these parts, like in here, to some of the works I'll show next. This is a piece called Hollow, also made in uh, 2011. So in making um, the, the big drawing, I generated a lot of scrap paper, a lot of scrap tracing paper in particular. Um, and I just started looking at it, <coughs> drawing on it, drawing colors on it, and then stapling these into these forms. I think the area I showed you on that previous drawing, to me it really is really quite close and relates to, to um, a shape like that. I liked um, how they seem to hold the air and how they seem to um, hold color as well. I really loved the feeling of seeing um, the color be, um, sort of behind uh, the tracing paper, kind of diffuse, but still being able to see it. There's a few more of these. So this is just colored pencil on tracing paper, flat. And this is it in a form. This is the first time I really, maybe since undergraduate time, I had made anything in three dimensions, or at least in relief. Um, 
I had for a while been feeling this desire, this need to get, to have more sort of physicality and to manipulate my materials more. Just I wanted to feel like I was moving stuff around. And I, so I like that about it. There's another little piece. Candy and gems. So I think um, already <coughs> some of the other things you've seen, some of the, 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 the imagery and the colors, certainly the very kind of sweet colors from the, um, that big drawing and there too, um, shows sort of my you know, aesthetic pull towards the colors of candy and gems and colored glass and such. Um, I'm now going to read a bit from Diana Tweet's essay. This is how she starts the essay called Material Assumptions. Diana writes, an assortment of unwrapped hard candies left in blazing sunlight atop a sheet of blotting paper will inevitably melt. More than that, their psychedelic sugars will leach into and wick through to the back of the rag paper. What results is an uncannily direct still life image embedded in the moistened, thinned, and now translucent plant paper fibers. Held up to the light, this variation on a transfer drawing resembles a piece of stained glass. It is something of a pop art sudarium, Latin for a sweat cloth, like Veronica's veil, if you will. Couldn't help but seeing that as a sweet cloth. <laughs> For Andrea Seltzer, who had been working on a series of drawings based on these candies, this inadvertent fusion of pigment and paper spoke to the frustration that she had been experiencing in trying to push through, physically and conceptually, the surface tension of the picture plane. It took me a while to sort of get that it wasn't necessarily just the candy that I was interested in, but the translucency the color, the way that color it permeated the substance. <coughs> sort of going through my notebooks, however, I realized that I've been sort of circling around this for some time. The list is compiled from, from several years, and every now and again I would just jot a few words down um, relating to this <coughs> image that I had of, of glass <coughs> and gems and you know, green glass, candy land flowers, woodcuts like little gems, bejeweled bird, gems as monuments, a stock of life, a stack of lifesavers, tropical variety, <laughs> carbon paper crown jewels, hidden jewels, gold leaf tongue, colorful, garish, bright, joyful colors, lino cut with lost gems, green transparent spots, emeralds or patches of land, piles of candies pile of blackened candies, gems, pile, candy camel, candy heads, candy flash. <laughs> so I went back and also looked at the sort of the way candies come up in some of the imagery. So back to the earlier drawing I showed you, the, the big uh, uh, drawing, um, ink drawing spillway. So already I'm, I'm interested in the form. Like, I love the stripes wrapping around these forms. They're just fun to draw. They're um, quite beautiful. And also in this detail that I showed you earlier, firelight, you can see sort of gem-like and candy-like little sparkles in there. I think it also goes back to that, that quote I read you about um, from Simon Shama about coming across the the uh, great coat buttons in the, in, in the, um, amidst the woodland ferns. And it's like these, um, I don't know if you, I had loads of these dreams when I was a kid of like um, finding little treasures in the grass or something. And it's kind of that kind of feeling of, of discovery. What do you find amidst all this stuff? Little sparkles of, uh, of color. And then there's some where using the, the candies as, and, and, pretty obvious way. 
Um, that one's also about the size of the piece. It's called Ashore, and it's the candy is colored pencil, and the rest is um, graphite powder applied with a brush. This one is called Cluster. I was kind of uh, trying to get out also that sort of sickly sweet, kind of too sweet, like rotten sweet, <laughs> sticky kind of feeling that um, you certainly couldn't see it in there. And um, I came across this quote that I, I wrote, wrote back, I wrote down back in 2001, so over 10 years ago, and I was surprised to come across it. So clearly this idea of sugar and candy and stuff has struck a chord with me for some time. And this is from Sabol's book called Ring of Saturn, Rings of Saturn, excuse me. And I mean, it's a, it's a work of fiction, so I don't know how true this is, but if there are any uh, budding art historians or any art historians out there, you can, you can tell me. Perhaps would be, be a good topic of research. Anyway, there's a character in the book called De Jong, and he's um, talking about, quotes, the curiously close relation relationship that existed until well into the 20th century between the history of sugar and the history of art. The Hay, and then he goes on for a bit, the Hague or the Tate Gallery in London were originally endowed by the sugar dynasties. The capital amassed in the 18th and the 19th centuries through various forms of slave economy is still in circulation, said de Jong, still bearing interest, increasing many times over, and continually burgeoning anew. He goes on for a bit and then says, at times it seems to me, said de Jong, as if all works of art were coated with a glaze of sugar. And that's a detail from Cluster. Another very sweet, someone, a friend of mine saw this and said, I gave him a toothache. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one's called Crown. It's about uh, 40 by 45 inches. The detail from it. Again, you can see the imagery of sort of the embedded candies. So I think I was beginning to realize that it wasn't so much the candies I was interested in, although I was that too, but beyond that, about capturing colored light. Um, and I feel like I began to sort of scratch at the surface of this when I started making these dome forms. Now we're getting to some pieces that are in the, the current exhibition. This is a small um, dome-like shape made with tracing paper and map pins um, held together with map pins. They're like five pieces. And it's just like a, you know, a, a half a sphere shape. And they're about the size of maybe a child's head. Um, mostly the, um, the color on these is mostly uh, relief ink on paper, and but there's some bits like you can see the top um, that's uh, watercolor on paper. And what I did was I just generated lots of these um, um, pieces of paper that had various shapes and patterns and colors of of uh, of the ink or the watercolor, and um, with the idea that I was going to cut them up and then start making forms out of them. So I, I showed you the earlier forms that were a bit more sort of convoluted and complex, uh, the tracing paper forms. I was making those and I just started sort of simplifying the form into to this dome shape. And um, I just kept making more of them. And I made hundreds of them. <laughs> That's another example. So I just kept making more and more, and I really just wanted to have them accumulate 
and to grow and to cover an entire wall with them. Um, this is in my studio. You can see in the bottom left, that's a sort of composite of a, of a Goya painting. Um, initially, I was thinking that I would use these and arrange them so that they would make kind of a drawing. And <clears throat> I realized, for me at the time anyway, that felt like a, a dead end. This is um, these are the, the dome forms at um, the Perimeter Gallery at Chase's Daily in Belfast. And I was kind of liking more the sort of scattered approach of them, or scattered uh, layout of them. And here, just putting it next to a, a detail from a, an earlier image I showed you, to me, the sort of the similarity in, in sort of spatial relationships without knowing it at the time um, was kind of uncanny. At least to me they feel really similar. So after the show at um, Chase's Daily, I brought all the little hats home <laughs> and discovered I liked them best sort of just in a pile on a horizontal surface rather than on a wall. So here they are just in a pile in my studio. And here they are in the, the current exhibit, half of which is at the Glickman Library, kind of stuck in this cabinet mm -hmm. in a crowd. I wanted them to feel like this kind of crowd of things jostling each other. Um, actually, that piece is called Jostle and Hyde. It sounds like Jekyll and Hyde, I just realized. Um, it's really hard to, to, to photograph these, um, so I do hope you get to see them in person. Just a close up. There are the, with the candies. <laughs> um, I feel like with, the, with this work, uh, these sort of 3D tracing paper forms. I'm starting to get at some of the, the um, other themes or concept, whatever, however you want to call them, that I talked about earlier. Um, kind of synthesizing some of these, I'll call them preoccupations that I had. Um, the idea of cum accumulation, so I've got lots of these. The idea of sort of translucent and saturated colors. And then also something that has the lightness of air. I feel like I'm maybe onto something. I should have put the clock up here. I have no idea if I'm doing on time. But I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, and the last bit, I wanted to talk um, about another sort of iconic form that I've been sort of circling around and using in my work. Um, these cones and their relationship to, to Goya. Um, this is a small um, color pencil drawing on intaglio. It's called Dunce. I was thinking them of dun uh, th thinking, excuse me, thinking of them as dunce caps. There's another one, um, pastel on, on oil. And this is a dunce or a traffic cone or whatever if you want to see it as in, cast in, in ice. So I did this a couple. I did this just for on a lark, just because I wanted to. And I actually really had fun. And I did it with just using food coloring. I'd like to make a whole field of them. They're quite stunning in the sunlight. And there's a, a cone form again in the, in the cabinet piece. It's in the same cabinet where you saw the, the accumulation of, of domes. And it kind of made me laugh. I like the relationship of that cone and all the little cone-shaped lamps that you see through, through the room. So perhaps some of you recognize this. It's a drawing by uh, Goya. 
um, during the Inquisition, um, heretics were required to wear these conical caps um, in processions. Let's see that what he's holding is a whip or something for self-flagellation. Um, there's something about how a, a form can hold just so much, so many associations that I was really um, interested in. I just, beyond sort of the subject matter, I just love how Goya uses space. If you have any, any sort of issues or um, questions with composition, I just think he's a great artist to, to look at. So if you, oh no, not this one, sorry. And this is a painting of, of Goya's um, called The Procession of Flagellants um, from 1812 to 1819. Um, and if you sort of take a special note of the form of that figure, you'll see it cropping up in this drawing. see it in the upper right. This is a drawing that's at, um, also in the, the current show. It's called uh, Green Bluff, and um, it's colored pencil on uh, paper, and it's also one that Diana talks about in the essay um, beautifully. Um, see, in a lot of my drawings that um, an important part of, of, of the drawing is what I don't draw the white spaces that I leave, um, and again, that's important in this, and there's also that sense of the, the folding, I think, that um, Dan Caney talked about in, in the other piece. It's another uh, painting, really strange painting, um, by Goya called Witch's Flight, and um, I make use of, of the imagery becomes kind of like a, a search picture, you know, where, where is it? But you can see the, maybe, <laughs> the cones um, here coming together here, the faces, and then the, the prone, the, the, the um, person being carried off lying here. Um, I think I mentioned earlier this sort of the tension between depicting and then erasing, kind of making something kind of nameable that you can recognize and then wanting to obliterate that. And a lot of my work sort of lives in that place of, do I see something or do I not? And then as you think you see it, it kind of dissolves into something else. Um, which is the way I think um, sort of memory functions. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to have that, um, that feeling. Okay, and now I'm just going to show some um, images from the current show called Verge, as you know. And, um, but, and I will take a, a few of the pieces and talk about um, a little bit more of a process. So this is a wall um, of woodcuts, woodblock prints, I should say. Um, and you'll probably notice there's the one on the left, which is kind of the outlier, and then the five others are kind of in a, in a series. They're all done on paper. Um, um, the ones, the five in the series are in a really thin Japanese paper. So the, the paper nearly disappears, right? Um, and they're also framed differently. Um, the one on the left is a slightly earlier piece. Um, and um, it's in more of a traditional frame, and I really, when I was thinking about framing this work, wanted to try something different. And so they're more like boxes rather than traditional frames. And part of the idea was, too, to have a, a dialogue between this work and the work that was in the, in the library that are in cases. Um, I wanted them almost to feel like specimens <coughs> in the box rather than something about framing felt a little, I don't know, too neat, too crafty or something. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, a, a nifty system where um, we fasten the, the frame, which just had the two sides and the bottom, screwed it directly into the wall, 
then put the piece up with two magnets right on the screws, then slid in the plexiglass, and then put on the cover and screwed it in. So it's actually framed in on site. And I like, I, there's something about that that I, that I really liked. So the, <clears throat> the piece all the way on the left is called Sugar Hill. The other ones are um, floating hills. <coughs> so I just want to give a sense of how this piece came together. Again, it's called Sugar Hill. It's the, the piece that's on the cover of the essay. So this, this um, again, it's about this big, 38 by 38 by 30 or something like that. Um, it started out as this tiny little drawing, probably about this big. It's actually um, the back of my father's head. <laughs> So it got translated to this in the woodcut. You can see there's a bit, <clears throat> that bright green layer is actually a monoprint layer. Um, and after this stage, I didn't know what to do. So I know I was talking to some of you this morning about, you know, what do you do when you don't know what to do next? And I just left it like that, probably for about a year, a year and a half. And then I was doing other work, etc. I was working for the Bates Show, you know, making work for the Bates Show. And I made that piece called Red Dew. This is a, a close-up. With all these little red dots that, um, in, in a green field that to me kind of represented words or sentences. Um, well, they could look like berries, whatever. But after I made that, that's when I thought, this is what I want to do for the woodcut. You never know where the source is going to come for the next step. So that's it with these little red dots throughout. So, back to that for a second. So this was an example of, you know, starting with that tiny little drawing and sort of translating it, reinterpreting it into something else. And so I was going 2D to 2D. With the Floating Hill series, what I was doing was looking at the, um, the small domes I made and making portraits of those. So I was going from 3D to 2D and also enlarging them uh, quite a bit. Again, the domes are about six inches and the woodcut's about, um, the actual image part is about 20 inches. So the one on the left, a little 3D piece held together with pins. The one on the right, a portrait of that dome. Um, with some changes. You know, you realize when you scale up or something, it wasn't quite working. So you can see the changes I made in this area in particular. Does that imagery kind of look familiar, perhaps? So again, those Goya heads, cones coming up. This is just to give you a sense. This is the the wood block I was working on, um, and um, that area masked out, and the paper registered beforehand, before you put the ink on, inked on with the brayer, paper put down, and then rubbed on the back. Um, you can see some of these little areas where the um, ink would be applied with the brush or my finger. Those are three of them hanging in, in my studio. You can see how thin the paper is there as well. Um, I'm hanging that way. I don't know. Sometimes I like it better that way. <laughs> but to go in public, they have to do that <laughs> or something like that. <coughs> um, I know I showed you this already, but I'm just, again, going through some of the things in the <coughs> present show, <coughs> the domes. So the five that I made portraits of are in amongst the crowd there. These are some of the things that are in the, the, the horizontal cases in the library. And I really kind of think of the work in the cases, these little remnant scraps, as kind of like uh, the work in my sketchbooks. It's almost um, it's just remnant stuff, almost. Um, 
at least, you know, with some resolution, hopefully. But rather than just writing down an idea of what I want to do, just do it, put it in there, and, and move on. So I only have a few pictures of these because, again, it was very hard to photograph. It's also the quiet reading room. So you, every time I do something in there and I was setting up the show, I was very much aware of every little noise I was making. Just a, a tiny little scrap. This is a piece of paper floating on some uh, map pins held in self-hardening clay. I think you could maybe, this is looking straight down on it through the case. And this is looking at it, at, you know, looking at it kind of lower down through the case. This is actually taken in my studio, but it's in one of the cases. Um, it's a black and very dark purple um, woodcut of a snapdragon flower. Again, these all together. This is now again in the area gallery. Um, these the three in the wooden boxes here are <coughs> uh, relief pieces, pieces that I made sewed together with the fragments of, of the Floating Hill series that either I didn't like or I just wanted to, to make into another form. And there we are, back to the beginning and the end. <laughs> So that you can see that's a, a, a relief piece. I think you can see it better on that slide. Um, with sewn together pieces. And I'm really, really quite excited about this piece and also how it related to Green Bluff. And I'm feeling like I want to make something really on a large scale that's like that. Um, relief perhaps on the wall, perhaps um, resting on the floor. So with that, I would, we'll close and would love to hear any questions you might have for me. Um, do the preformed subjects like the soldiers change shape as you do the drawing, or do they hold their same gestural shape? I'm um, parts stayed the same, but no, I, I often just um, went across boundaries and yeah, kind of exploded that. It was just more of a starting framework than something that I felt like I had to stick with. Though, as a framework, I really stuck with it more than I do in most pieces. And a lot of pieces, I'll, or a number of them, I should say a lot, I start with some sort of framework. I think in Spillway I had a figure initially, but you know, I just lost that very early on in the process. So I think with that one, you, if you looked hard enough, you could still find elements of those, but you'd have to be told that they were there to, to even find them. It's just a way, it's just kind of a way in, really. 